Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Erkin, and want to welcome all of you to our Friday morning um, uh, Journal Club. And it's really a pleasure to have two outstanding individuals presenting this morning. Um, our initial presenter is Dr. Sergei Kushinov. Um, Kushyov is who is a neuroradiologist at Moffitt Cancer Center and an assistant professor of oncological sciences at University of South Florida. Um, uh, Dr. Kushyov has um, had a remarkable uh, journey to where he is right now. He trained as a neurosurgeon in the Ukraine um, and then obtained a PhD in neuroscience and was a research fellow at the Barrow Neurological Institute. He then went on to complete a residency in diagnostic radiology, followed by a neuroradiology fellowship at Johns Hopkins. His research and clinical interests are focused on thyroid cancer, as well as spine pathology and malignant brain tumors. Um, and our discussion this morning um, is uh, coming to us from Australia. Dr. Monica Rossley is chairman of the Department of Nuclear Medicine at Prince of Wales and Sydney Children's Hospital a position that she has held since 1994. She is also a conjoint associate professor of medicine at the University of New South Wales. Dr. Rossley is the chair of the Prince of Wales multidisciplinary thyroid meetings, and she is internationally renowned for her expertise in the diagnosis and management of thyroid cancer. Um, she is uh, uh, commonly um, uh, called upon uh, to uh, present at uh, international meetings on virtually every continent. Um, and so I want to thank both of our presenters this morning. As with every morning, um, Friday morning, we encourage all of our attendees to, um, uh, to write in questions, and we hope to have a bit of time before the nine o'clock hour to be able to get to those after Ross, Dr. Rossley finishes up her presentation. Uh, so with that, um, Dr. Khrushchev, I uh, welcome you and look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for my introduction. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And we, we're going to start with a case presentation. So we have a 50-year-old male patient who presents with a growing mass in the neck and coarseness that has progressed over the past four months. On ultrasound, the mass is described as a single solid nodule uh, 3.1 by 2.6 by 2.1 centimeter with oval shape just wider than tall smooth margins and microcalcifications. FNA biopsy was performed and reported as malignant with a step four. Molecular tests were ordered displaying a red germ line mutation. The patient was scheduled to undergo a total thyroidectomy. But based on the above characteristics and with the poss possible diagnosis of major thyroid cancer, which of the following studies would you perform prior to thyroidectomy? So we have four choices, A, calcitonin, B, ultrasound, C, CTNAC, and D, fdg -PAT. Please vote. Okay, so we have interesting answers. Okay, let's go through imaging uh, of major thyroid carcinoma. So last year we published this paper where we collected the critical aspects of imaging in MDC and uh, special thanks to Dr. Carl, uh, Carl, Carl Pasek from NIH for unique uh, illustrations. So before I start, I will ask, uh, ask you a very simple question. Do you think that major thyroid carcinoma is a good name for this neoplasm? Just think for a second. My answer is no. MTC is a neuroendocrine tumor and its name says nothing about that. Neuroendocrine tumor of the colon is carcinoid in contrast to adenocarcinoma that arises from epithelium. In adrenals, we have pheochromocytoma and ACC. Pancreas, we have PNET and adrenal carcinoma. 
In thyroid, we have a battery of different thyroid carcinomas. Their names look alike, and it's very easy to forget about neuroendocrine nature of MTC, especially if you don't see patients with MTC very often. So my best suggestion is to change to something like MANET, major neuroendocrine tumor of thyroid, but we will be working on that. But the whole point is just, it's very easy to confuse. Epithelium of follicles give rise to papillary and follicular cancer. In contrast, MTC arises from parafollicular cells. Surgery remains the only curative treatment for MTC, and chemotherapy and radiation therapy have very limited use. Therefore, imaging has exceptional significance. It should guide surgery. Development of, of MTC is related to red gene mutation. The first step is C-cell hyperplasia with mildly elevated markers of the tumor, then neoplastic transformation, metastatic disease, and in some patients, de-differentiation of the tumor with pseudo-normalization of the markers. We have two types, sporadic and hereditary. Sporadic uh, tumor constitutes 75%, and uh, patients have somatic cell mutation. These patients are older, they have solitary and typically unilateral tumors. In contrast to hereditary tumors, where patients have uh, germ cell mutation, they are younger, and they have bilateral multicentral disease. Three syndromes associated with MTC, MAN2A, MAN2B, and a familial MTC. Multiple red mutation uh, may be responsible for MTC, and survival is best in familial MTC and worse in MAN2B patients. Okay, now let's go to imaging. We're going to review modern imaging technique first and then move toward clinical applications. We have ultrasound, CT, MRI, and, uh, and also we have a very powerful tool with nuclear medicine techniques, with fluorodopa, with fdg pad and somatostatin receptor compounds. Ultrasound. Ultrasound is number one for evaluation of thyroid nodules and lymph node metastasis. You can see this is MTC, primary MTC. This is also primary MTC, and this is metastatic lymph node associated with MTC. So CT is best for evaluation of neck and mediastinal lymph nodes, as well as uh, lung metastasis. So we cannot say something meaningful for lymph nodes more than uh, less than one centimeter, and CT also provides excellent characterization of osseous lesions. However, for visualization of bone marrow infiltration, spinal canal uh, assessment, and soft tissue uh, lesions, we, we need MRI. So here we have a uh, metastatic lymph node, we have mediastinal lymphadenopathy, we have multiple um, uh, metastatic uh, lung nodules, uh, lung metastasis, and lesion. Um, just I remove this, and osseous lesion in the spine, the vertebra. Okay, MRI provides excellent visualization of sub-tissue lesions, intra-abdominal lymph nodes, bone, and liver. So in oncology, we have new, several new techniques which potentially could be used in MTC, including dynamic contrast imaging, diffusion-weighted images, and PET MRI hybrid imaging. So this is, uh, we have in this panel, we have images of whole body MRI with DWI and dynamic contrast imaging. So you see excellent visualization of different metastases in the mediastinum, in the lungs, in the liver, and in, uh, in the bone. So also DC provides excellent visualization of the lesions in the mediastinum, liver, and, and bone. So I, uh, my favorite technique is DWI. In DWI, we assess diffusion. 
tumor cells have limited or so-called restricted diffusion. And ADC map is actually a mirror of uh, uh, diffusion. So this technique actually can provide a assessment of tumor burden, and we can build up the histogram like that, so this is whole body DWI, this is pre-treatment, after treatment, and this is histogram, this is um, area of tumors, and this is normal ranges. So you see this peak is basically the uh, tumor cells. And look at what happens uh, after treatment, all this peak moves toward normal cells. We can, with this technique, we, we assess the response to treatment. And there's no data on MTC. Now, this is wonderful technique, nuclear medicine technique with DOPA. So fluorodopa is number one tracer for patients with metastatic MTC. So excellent review was published in 2012 by Treglia. So he showed that detection rate uh, was, per patient was 66% and uh, per lesion was 71%. Excellent technique, the best technique for major thyroid carcinoma. So negative results may be associated with small lesions or de-differentiated uh, tumors. And uh, detection rate also depends on calcitonin level and doubling time. FTG, MTC is slow growing tumor with low level of glucose metabolism, with low level of GLUT receptor expression. Therefore, avidity of the lesions and SUV max is relatively low compared to those in other cancers. So FDG is best for patients with aggressive disease, with de-differentiated tumors. And also, again, excellent review, the same order, Treglia, he showed that detection rate per patient was 59%. And again, the, the detection rate increased with uh, depended on calcitonin level and doubling time. Um, diagnostic value of somatostatin receptor scans are a little bit limited and seems like is not as good as uh, uh, fluorodopa. So you see there was only one study published. Uh, unfortunately, somatostatin uh, gallium dot date was not that, as good, so only 33%. Uh, detection rate per, per patient. So the current concept is following. So for tumors with high degree of cell differentiation, fluorodopa is the best. And for more aggressive de-differentiated tumor, uh, FDG uh, path is a method of choice. This is a uh, uh, images taken from the literature where DOPA is superior to FDG. So you have a lesion here, this is FDG. Uh, this is the lesion and it's way better seen on fluorodopa scan, you see it here. This is a different situation when FDG is better than DOPA. So you see multiple lesions in the neck and mediastinum, better seen on FDG compared to DOPA. And also liver lesion is better seen on FDG. So here's the problem. Fluorodopa is not approved for MTC. It is in clinical use. It is approved for Parkinson's disease, but technically we cannot use it for, for MTC. So we can, uh, we basically produce a lot of facilities they can produce. It's not very expensive, but unfortunately insurance companies don't cover that. So it, it is not uncommon when professional societies to, uh, recommend using different PET tracers without a DG approval. So for instance, uh, endocrine society in these guidelines devoted to pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, they recommended fluorodopa for evaluation of patients with proven paraganglioma. But this is not a case with major thyroid carcinoma. We have our guidelines from American Thyroid Association. So unfortunately, these guidelines, they have multiple, multiple problems, and I'm not going to review all of them, but uh, I just would like to bring up several points pertaining to imaging. So uh, I would like to, to say about two problems. Problem number one, so 
American Thyroid Association guidelines, they introduce a cutoff calcitonin for calcitonin 150 picogram per milliliter, simply 150 and 500 cutoffs. So regarding 150 cutoff, uh, ATA do not recommend any imaging except ultrasound of the neck for patients who have calcitonin level less than 150. <clears throat> and this conclusion comes from the paper of published by Pellegrini and Quarters in 2003. So I, I reviewed this paper. There is, there is no research regarding that cutoff. And moreover, many patients who had recurrent disease, they have calcitonin level less than 150, for instance. This lady, she had calcitonin level of 36 with bone metastasis. This uh, gentleman, he had lung metastasis with calcitonin level of 125. And then this patient, uh, she had a calcitonin level of 20, uh, 121 with liver metastasis. So it's a little bit confusing. So I'm not sure if this cutoff is really exists and the second cutoff is 500 uh, uh, cutoff for calcitonin comes from publication uh, uh, in 2010 by Drale and uh, Machen so what these authors evaluated they they showed that patients with calc calcitonin level less than 100 were biochemically cured only 81% of patients with calcitonin level ranged from 100 to 500 had normal post-op calcitonin level. That means that 19% of patients had metastasis outside the surgical area. And we don't know where because imaging was not analyzed on this study. So again, this cutoff is a little bit tricky. Uh, so the only conclusion what we can do is just patients with pre-op calcitonin level more than 100 might benefit from comprehensive imaging to evaluate for distal metastasis. So the second major problem of ATA guidelines is they don't support any PET CT for MTC and there is no rational for that decision. It's very confusing. So Order says that FDG and DOPA PET CT are less sensitive to other imaging procedures, referring to Beta Gulred in 2003. But if you look at the chart from that paper, there is no no no, no evaluation of uh, DOTA uh, fluoro DOTA. So it's a very confusing again, and they completely ignore reviews performed by Treglia. So in 2000, so the second major problem of ATA guidelines is guidelines they don't support a European Association of Nuclear CT Medicine published there, and there is no uh, rational paper for that where decision. basically they respond. So Water says that during DOPA point CT are less sensitive uh, to other imaging procedures. Of nuclear medicine. I would recommend in 2000 read this paper. It's a wonderful paper. But so if you look at the chart from that paper, a situation no, uh, no man, imaging, no, no evaluation, very complicated. Uh, uh, many uh, believe that MTC so is slow growing. It's a very confusing yeah. again. Just and the creation of no up is reviews okay. Performed by track current guidelines from ATA, they basically promote this approach. This is cancer. What we are waiting for, it's it's a cancer. A patient can can benefit from appropriate oncological approach and staging, including nuclear medicine techniques. So this is what we suggest and we offer. So uh, in pre-op evaluation, we certainly sh should do ultrasound and FNA uh, with calcitonin aspirate assay. And based on Draley paper, so if patient has pre-op calcitonin level more than 100, probably we need to do PET-CT for staging. Then surgery and uh, uh, depends on a calcitonin level. If it is normal, no imaging is needed. And if calcitonin level is elevated, again, we need to do metastatic workup. So we'll review, let's go through this algorithm in details. So primary tumor, majority of the lesions uh, on ultrasound hypoechoic with 
calcifications and typically these tumors are located in the lateral upper one third of the gland where the maximal concentra maximum concentration of C-cells. So there are two types of uh, ultrasound patterns were described as M-type with aggressive features like malignant and B-type like benign type without aggressive features. So if the tumor more than one centimeter, uh, it is associated with uh, increased risk of lymph node metastasis. Unfortunately, up to 50% of patients have lymph node metastasis in the neck at the time of surgery. So then we do FNA with considering assay. And again, what we discussed, staging. Staging and pre-op evaluation to assess for uh, metastatic disease, probably best for patients with calcitonin 11 more than 100. Surgery is a standard of care, uh, thyroidectomy with uh, lip node dissection and uh, prophylactic thyroidectomy for patients with MEN2 syndrome. So post-op post imaging, again, we start with uh, baseline calcitonin with a new baseline two, three months after the surgery. And then if it is undetectable, do nothing. And then if it is elevated, we should do something to check for metastasis. And in, in this situation, certainly fluorodopa and uh, FDG PET are the best. So fluorodopa is best modality and can detect small lesions uh, starting from six millimeters and uh, uh, basically this is a case where the patient underwent surgery the post-op calcitonin calcet level was 54 uh, ultrasound showed this suspicious lymph node and then uh, three tracers uh, were performed that ct with fluorodopa fdg pad and with uh, uh, gallium dotatate, and you see a very small do uh, dot on fluorodopa PET CT uh, consistent with metastasis. The patient was reoperated and completely cured. So, regarding visualization of metastatic lymph nodes, again, ultrasound and CT are best techniques. Here's the large metastatic lymph node on ultrasound and uh, large metastatic lymph nodes on. CT. Regarding distant metastasis, about 17% of patients have distant metastasis at the time of diagnosis. 38% of patients, they develop metastasis after surgery, and unfortunately, 56% of patients will die within the first five years uh, after the presentation of the disease. So pulmonary metastasis develop in roughly in half, uh, uh, half uh, patients with metastatic disease. Typically, these are numerous and uh, small. Small, uh, uh, small metastasis is characteristic uh, for uh, pulmonary, liver, and osseous metastasis. Again, we see multiple small metastases in the lung. This is uh, a solitary lesion. and um, metastatic lipidinopathy. So hepatic lesions, again, small and numerous. This is typical for MTC. Uh, calcifications occur in approximately one third of cases, uh, and uh, MRI is the best technique for visualization of metastatic lesions. This is CT, and look at MRI. So. MRI is way better. And this is my favorite DWI. You see excellent visualization in the identification of all metastatic lesions. This is DC and this is T2 imaging. Osseous metastasis. Again, multiple and small. So 50% of patients, they, they have skeletal related events and uh, metastatic lesions could be osteolytic, osteoblastic or mixed. For evaluation of osseous metastasis, we typically use CT, MRI, PET, and bone scan. CT is good for evaluation of bone destruction, but poor visualization of bone marrow infiltration. 
uh, MRI is good for bone marrow infiltration, but poor visualization of uh, bone destruction. Pathways uh, we use for, uh, for assessment of treatment response and bone scan is an inexpensive screening tool and we can use for, again, for treatment response. Now, let's quickly review uh, MEN2 syndromes. So we, as I said, patients with hereditary uh, MTC usually uh, uh, have uh, either MEN2A, uh, FMTC, uh, or um, MEN2B syndrome. So MEN2A, patients have parathyroid neoplasm, majorly thyroid carcinoma, or paraganglioma. Parathyroid neoplasm. So 25% of patients with MEN2A have parathyroid pathology. It is either single adenoma or hyperplasia. There is no consensus how to treat these lesions. So this is a ectopic parathyroid adenoma in MEN2A syndrome. Medullary thyroid carcinoma. All patients will have it. This is the first feature to manifest in MEN2A typically bilateral with calcifications. We have to screen patients with, uh, with MTC for pheochromocytoma prior to surgery. So this is a patient with bilateral MTCs. You see on the right, you see on the left, this is the lesions. Pheochromocytoma usually present after MTC and malignant in 4% of cases. Um, this is fluorodopa. Patient have bilateral paraganglioma, uh, pheochromocytomas. You see on the right, the left. This is MRI on the same patient. MAN 2A, to B, sorry. So, uh, majority of patients have morphanoid habitus, and uh, all patients have mucosal neuromas. So, majority thyroid carcinoma is more aggressive uh, in MAN2B compared to MAN2A. And uh, patients should undergo surgery within first year of life. This is gallium dotatate. The patient has MTC, you can see here, and also bilateral pheochromocytomas here and here. So pheochromocytomas also, these lesions are more aggressive compared to MEN2A syndrome. So this is fluorodopa scan. You can see uh, bilateral uh, pheochromocytomas with metastasis. So all of these bright dots are metastasis. So FMTC syndrome is now considered as a part of MEN2A syndrome. And in conclusion, three things to remember from my presentation. MTC is a neuroendocrine malignancy. So DOPA is the best uh, modality, best technique to evaluate patients with MTC. And always remember about oncological approach to MTC. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope you understand my Australian accent. Um, I just will show you. Uh, this is my hometown, Sydney, just to orientate you. And I hope one day post COVID, you can come and visit us. This is uh, Macquarie Lighthouse. My home is about three miles south of here. And our university campus group of hospitals is about 10 miles south of here. Um, I have no conflict of interest to um, report or financial conflict. Um, so as outlined, it's medullary thyroid cancer is a neuroendocrine tumour arising from neural crest derived from perifollicular C cells secreting calcitonin. Uh, it accounts for 1 to 2 percent only of all thyroid cancers. So they're, they're uncommon compared to papillary and follicular. 75% of cases are sporadic and 25% of cases are hereditary. 
Um, and as outlined, MEN2A is associated with theochromocytoma parathyroid adenoma, and the MEN MEN2B is an aggressive form that occurs in infancy. Uh, the hereditary cases have BRET mutations, but in, in sporadic cases, half of them also have BRET mutations. So MEN2-related uh, thyroid, medullary thyroid cancers are generally multicentric and bilateral. Uh, sporadic cases tend to occur in adults between 40 and 60 years of age, and usually unifocal, and um, medullary thyroid cancer is frequently aggressive as outlined in the initial talk. 48% um, of patients have localised disease, T1 disease at presentation, but even with T1 disease, 14% of them have central neck compartment and 11% have lateral neck lymph node metastases. In 35% of patients at presentation, the tumours are T4 tumours that extend beyond the thyroid. And in this group, 84% have central neck and 93% have lateral neck lymph node metastases. And at presentation, about 13% have distant metastases. Uh, the five-year survival um, AJCC stage one is 100% drops to about 86% stage two, 74% stage three, and 25% in stage four disease. Now, um, the diagnosis, uh, at diagnosis, it can be problematic uh, unless serum calcitonin is measured and found to be elevated. Now, in the uh, European uh, guidelines, they recommend routine measurement of calcitonin in all thyroid nodules. The American Thyroid Association does not recommend routine calcitonin measurement. And at our institution, we don't routinely measure calcitonin on all thyroid nodules. It's actually a specialized test, not routinely done in every laboratory and the blood usually has to be sent off to a central laboratory measuring this. Uh, fine needle aspiration may not be diagnostic unless specific staining is undertaken for calcitonin or calcitonin measurements are undertaken in the needle washouts. Again, this is not routine in fine needle aspiration biopsy. And these tumours may be reported as an atypical follicular pattern, uh, particularly if calcitonin assessment is not undertaken. And I would have to say more often than not, the diagnosis is only made at the time of histological evaluation of the operative specimen. So the way I see the role of imaging is in these four settings. Um, imaging is used at diagnosis, uh, particularly in determining preoperative assessment as to what kind of operation is to be undertaken, which lymph nodes are to be resected. Um, it also uh, has a role in the assessment of disease extent and has an increasing role in monitoring treatment response and uh, the future is a theranostic application with imaging and then subsequent uh, radiation treatment based on the, on the results of the imaging. So at diagnosis, um, Imaging is required for preoperative staging, and the mainstay of assessment is ultrasound and CT scan. Now, Dr. Kushayev um, advocates very strongly for whole body MRI at initial staging. Uh, unfortunately, this is not easily utilised in Australia due to reduced accessibility and time constraints. Um, we don't have as many MRI machines, I think, as you have in the States, and they're not as um, accessible and reimbursement uh, for this indication is problematic as well. Um, now, assessment of disease extent often occurs in the post-operative setting. Um, whole body MRI is certainly useful, but PET-CT um, is also of use using the three traces already mentioned in the previous talk. Um, and PET-CT is predominantly used to detect persistent or recurrent disease determined by elevated calcitonin levels postoperatively. 
although there are there is a paper advocating doing F-DOPA preoperatively for detection of lymph node disease. This is not routinely done. Now, F-DOPA, as outlined, is an excellent imaging agent. Um, DOPA is the precursor of endogenous catecholamines and differentiated medullary thyroid cancer lesions take up this tra tracer by tracking the amino acid decarboxylation pathway. But the problem is um, the synthesis is difficult and there is a low labelling efficiency and it's not commercially available in Australia. I would be interested to know if it's commercially available in the States. Um, I don't believe it's commercially available in Europe um, and it's really only available in centres that have their own cyclotron and more importantly, as well as the cyclotron is the team of radiopharmaceutical scientists able to produce it. So in our country, um, Dr. Patterson's group in Brisbane um, produce F-DOPA and we send children up from Sydney to Brisbane to have F-DOPA imaging in um, neonatal uh, hyperinsulinism. Uh, we don't have it available currently in Sydney and we're the largest city in Australia. Um, it is certainly the preferred agent in well differentiated disease if you can get it. Uh, now, fluorine 18 FDG is the most used PET radiopharmaceutical worldwide. It's a glucose analogue and uptake correlates with high proliferative activity and reflects poorly differentiated disease, as Dr. Kushjaev explained. It's a bit analogous in thyroid cancer to uh, radioactive iodine and FDG flip-flop, um, you know, differentiated thyroid cancer iodine uptake, undifferentiated FDG, the same with medullary. Differentiated medullary F-DOPA takes it up uh, when it's poorly differentiated, FDG is the preferred agent. Now, gallium-68 somatostatin receptor imaging, there are a variety of um, traces available. In Australia, we generally use the dotatate. Um, it's taken up in differentiated medullary thyroid cancer cells, and it's certainly much easier to produce in-house with a gallium-68 generator. Um, these are widely available in Europe and Australia, and I'm not sure what the situation is in the States at present, um, but we have a gallium generator in our department, as do most um, uh, teaching hospital uh, departments in our city, and um, we're able to produce it on a weekly basis. Um, however, it certainly does have a lower sensitivity than F-DOPA, but it is more readily available. Um, of course, uh, the tumour markers are very important and the results of the tumour markers are used to determine when functional imaging is performed. Calcitonin is the specific tumour marker. Uh, CEA is non-specific, but it is very useful um, to apply in this disease. And doubling time of both are useful prognostic predictors. Um, as outlined, if the levels are high, if calcitonin greater than 150, or if there, are short, if there is a short doubling time, then you need to use both anatomical imaging as well as functional imaging using PET-CT. Um, I just want to go through a couple of recent cases at our institution. Uh, the first one is a 57-year-old female who um, presented in June of last year with a five centimeter mass in her left thyroid lobe. Now the preoperative cytology was of papillary. And so she proceeded to a total uh, thyroidectomy and central neck lymph node clearance. Now I know Dr. Freeman last, uh, last week advocated not doing routine central neck, but our uh, high volume thyroid surgeons prefer to do routine central neck at the time of thyroidectomy because it's much easier and has a lower complication rate than going into the central neck after thyroidectomy has been performed. So this lady did, did have central neck clearance, um, but despite, despite this, her post-operative calcitonin was 800 and there were no tumor cells in the central neck lymph nodes. Um, and you can see uh, post-operatively, because her calcitonin was 800, she underwent a dotatate scan, 
which revealed lateral neck disease in the left neck, as well as some faint uptake in the right anterior mediastinum and a midline skull focus. So she proceeded to a left lateral neck dissection and postoperatively her calcitonin dropped from 800 to 70, but slowly uh, over the ensuing few months it rose. So she had a follow-up gallium dotatate and FDG PET study. Um, now the image here on the right of the screen um, shows the disease in the um, level four lymph node. There's also a, a level two lymph node hiding behind the submandibular salivary gland. Um, this focus in the, is it in the anterior mediastinum was a prevascular lymph node measuring only seven millimeters in diameter. And then she had this focus in the midline uh, of the skull. So she went on and had the lateral neck uh, surgery. And you can see in this scan performed in June of this year, the lateral neck disease has gone. Uh, there's just a bit of post-operative blush um, at the level four level, but that was not tumor. But the focus in the right anterior mediastinum persisted as did the skull focus. She subsequently went on to recently to have this skull lesion removed, and this turned out to be an interosseous meningioma, not, not um, medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. So dotatate will go to meningioma as well. Uh, so now further surgery is planned to explore this right anterior mediastinum and remove this seven millimeter lymph node and potentially other lymph nodes involved, which we haven't been able to identify on imaging. Um, the third area is monitoring of treatment response. So FDG PET identifies patients with poor prognosis disease, and these patients um, uh, may be able to be treated with um, targeted therapies. Uh, such as tyrosine kinase inhibitors or RET inhibitors. So I'd like to show you another recent case. This is a two and a half year old boy called Rory, who um, probably has had medullary thyroid cancer most of his life. He's had intractable diarrhea and really had a late diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer. He was referred to our hospital from another city in our state. And at staging, he had quite extensive disease in both lobes of the thyroid extending into the anterior mediastinum and quite extensive right lateral neck disease. Um, a sur surgery was attempted, um, but unfortunately was quite complicated. A lot of blood loss tumor was uh, engulfing the jugular vein. And so he was closed up and no uh, debulking occurred. Uh, he was enrolled on the LOXO-RET18036 study and was treated with selpercatinib, which is a specific RET inhibitor. And after only one cycle of this RET inhibitor, his calcitonin fell from 72,000 down to 527. And you can see on these two scans, even though no resection has occurred in response to the RET inhibitor therapy, particularly all this disease in the right lateral neck is no longer apparent. Uh, and the degree of uptake throughout the thymus, thyroid and anterior mediastinum has reduced in intensity. So finally, I wanted to address the theranostic approach, which is an exciting potential future application. Um, gallium 68 is inferior in medullary thyroid cancer compared to other NETS tumors and it's more likely to be positive in higher calcitonin levels. But if the scan is positive, there is potential for treatment with radio-labeled somatostatin uh, using lutetium-177 or yttrium-90 for uh, radioablation. So I'd just like to conclude this talk um, by going through the references that I've used for this talk. So this year, the European, uh, European EANM, European Association of Nuclear Medicine, has published their practice guideline for PET-CT imaging in medullary thyroid cancer. And this was basically, I think, precipitated by Treglia uh, in this article already quoted, in which the EANM did not uh, uh, endorse the 
guidelines of the American Thyroid Association because of the um, statement that PET is of no use. So uh, I guess the, these 2015 guidelines were useful in precipitating research and, uh, and finally um, outlining guidelines for the use of PET-CT. Um, here we've got a, a publication from 2018. This was a multi-centre publication uh, from Germany, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and Japan, in which they've um, used um, van, vandetanib for treating medullary thyroid cancer and used um, FDG PET for monitoring that treatment response. Uh, this is an um, a article just published online so far in June of this year from a group from Turkey who found gallium-68 digitate imaging um, useful, very useful in the application of medullary thyroid cancer. Conversely, um, this paper out of Brazil by Castronovas published in 2018 um, did not find gallium that useful, apart from detecting significantly more bone metastases than, um, uh, than bone scan alone. Um, this is a French paper uh, outlining the benefits of uh, fluorine 18 dopa. Uh, this paper here, um, the Theranostics approach, this has come out of India and they outline their efficacy and safety of concomitant lutetium dotatate and low dose uh, kappa capacitabine in uh, advanced medullary thyroid cancer. So this is an early uh, Theranostics application using gallium dotatate for imaging if it's positive, uh, adding radionuclides that can deliver therapy. And this was a, a review article published um, this year in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. The authors again were from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and Germany um, on the um, future potential of theranostic imaging. I believe in America at present, there's a uh, trial going on of lutate PSMA therapy in the treatment of metastatic prostate cancer. And this um, has potential for application in other tumors such as medullary thyroid cancer. So I just want to end my talk. This is my sunset slide of Sydney Harbour Bridge and Sydney Opera House. And I hope we meet in person one day. So we'll go back to the question asked in the beginning about this gentleman with the lump in the thyroid biopsy was malignant, Bethesda stage four. Um, molecular tests showed RET germline mutation and the patient was scheduled for thyroidectomy um, based on the above characteristics and with the possible differential diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer, which of the following studies would you perform prior to thyroidectomy? Please um, vote now on the poll. Great. Well, thank you, um, both uh, Dr. Kushayev as well as Dr. Rossley, for these outstanding presentations. Um, these are really uh, terrific, and I want to thank both of you um, for your time and presenting and preparation. Um, I want to um, ask both of you uh, when you would advise um, doing uh, post-treatment um, imaging in search of obvious structural, dis apparent structural disease, um, what cutoff would you use um, as a time to perform a scan? And how does doubling time influence compare relative to the absolute level of calcitonin? Um, and so my question is, um, if you have a patient with um, an apparent, a, a lower, perhaps less than 100 calcitonin level, but a calcitonin time, doubling time of greater than or of less than six months, per, perhaps, um, would you at that time proceed with an exhaustive search for structural disease? Uh, perhaps if you could comment on that. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, um, my approach is more aggressive in terms of imaging. So all patients with abnormal calcitonin level should be considered as a potential with patients with uh, metastatic disease of unknown location. So therefore, our approach should be very clear. We should put all, do everything possible to find metastatic lesions and to treat this patient with surgery or uh, uh, new medications uh, that these days available. To, the goal is to cure the patient. So therefore, I would prefer so uh, doing imaging on any patient with abnormal post-op calcitonin level, probably after two, three months after the surgery, and uh, do whatever is possible, uh, all available techniques for a metastatic search. Yeah. So I would I would agree that the uh, aim of um, is to try and remove all disease because that's your only hope of cure. So I, I can't give you a cutoff figure, but if the calcitonin is elevated and if it's increasing in uh, in its number, then I would do imaging also, as um, as shown in that first case. Yeah, we're only around 100, but they were slowly increasing. So, um. so, so how does the, um, can you give us some parameters for um, calcitonin doubling time versus absolute calcitonin level where you would expect um, to, uh, uh, to get valuable imaging information? Um, and and um, how do you balance those two? Um, is it absolute? Um, uh, which is more important in your mind, the absolute number of calcitonin or the doubling time? And if you're unsuccessful in identifying um, a struck a locus of disease, when when do you repeat your imaging? At what period of time? Yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, we don't know when we should repeat the imaging if it is negative. Uh, probably within in six months, and to see if the, we can find something. Um, we don't have any cutoff again, any cutoffs for doubling time for calcitonin level. So there is a very confusing situation regarding imaging, as I said. Uh, my my suggestion is six months to repeat imaging everything is possible to to search for metastatic disease but again it's a slow growing tumor and may not we may not see anything again so. we have um the pleasure of having uh dr tuttle um on the line as um and i've asked to have him unmute um to make some comments and also uh dr Munir ghassani who is uh, the chief chief of nuclear medicine at mount sinai so mike and Munir, would you be able to comment on um these presentations and your thoughts on imaging mike yeah i think it, uh, these are okay i'll go first no problem the um and this is mike the, I, these are great presentations because it, it really shows us now all the wide variety of imaging techniques we have for medullary that you know we didn't have 20 years ago um, to me, it really boils down to what's detectable versus what's actionable. If you're a maximal sort of imager, then it's really critical to find every little small spot. Um, if you're like me, um, I don't think most of the people that have distant metastasis are curable, even if you can find them. Uh, we can't cure them with our drugs. We can't cure them with surgery. So we're less focused on finding every little teeny spot Kind of like in the kid's book, Where's Waldo? Can I find every little spot? We're more interested in can we find actionable disease? So I think uh, our approach is probably closer to Monica's in most of the patients. The ones that we do more of the imaging on, you, you can't uncouple doubling time from the actual level because a calcitonin that doubles from 50,000 to 100,000 is completely different than a calcitonin that doubles from one to two. So these low level calcitonins, the doubling time doesn't work for you. All this doubling time data really came from calcitonins in the hundreds to thousands range. So 
we look at the the level you can't ignore it less than 100 or 200 or 300 as long as it's not one of these aggressive measures it's primarily making cea that's usually small lymph nodes in the neck and we focus there if it keeps going up then we look in the chest we use mri for livers we use mri for bones I do tend to do it every six months and flip one uh, versus another, depending on the rate over time. So I think these are awesome tools to have. And certainly in individual patients, there are ones that we select to use them on. So Mike, when do you uh, pull the trigger and do uh, use F-DOPA imaging? Do you have that available? You know, we don't. We've talked about it. Um, I totally agree with the data. If If you let me pick any test for like, you know, really rising calcitonin levels or abnormalities in the liver that I'm not sure it's cancer or nonspecific stuff in the lungs that would be actionable if it was medullary cancer. Um, there'd be a wonderful role to play for DOPA, but since it's not reimbursed, um, we're not using it very much. If it was reimbursed, uh, we would absolutely be using it because I think the data on this is really solid. So maybe you can just comment on your definition of actionable. My assumption is you mean anything that um, involves lymph nodes that's within um, reach of a surgeon. Um, do you have any other criteria for what represents actionable? Yeah. So when we when we look, we use the term detectable versus actionable. It, we use it referring to either lymph nodes or distant metastasis, any disease that's there. And there's sort of five things that we look at. What's the size of the lesion? What's the location of the lesion? How rapidly is it changing? Is it causing any symptoms? And then the last one is patient preference. So location, size, rate of change, symptoms, and patient preference. Um, a small nodule sitting near the recurrent laryngeal nerve may need to come out. A large nodule in the middle of the lung that's asymptomatic, we may watch. So we really sort of think through like a pilot's checklist, those five things, and it's the answer to those five things that say, is it time for us to do something? Not the least of which is the last one, which is the patient preference, because we all have some patients that want us to do everything and then other patients that are more uh, sort of minimalist in their approach. So those are the five things that I think about, whether it's a lymph node in the neck, lung met, the decision to do treatment, surgery, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, those five things I think will help you understand, is it time to do something? Great. Uh, Dr. Ghassani, um, yeah. do you have any comments on these presentations? Sure. Uh, so both were excellent presentation and I really enjoyed uh, going through the journey of you know, all the available imaging uh, spectrum. And also uh, Mike's comments are very well appreciated. A few things, you know, since you saw so many different options are available for imaging, as well as you saw that there are differences in the degree of differentiation. So one approach would be to, if once you have looked at the histology and depending on where in that spectrum you are, you can choose to do your very first exam that matches the histology, which is what we are now aiming for personalized uh, imaging approach. So this way you can get the maximum impact. If you go from one scan to the other until you find your target that has the highest uptake, you may end up ordering multiple exams. So I highly recommend that for each case, we should look at the histology and decide which is the very first PET exam that should work. With regards to FDOPA, Mike's comments are correct that it's not reimbursable. If we have enough cases and if we can collaborate, one possibility would be to, to reach out and see if we can help uh, recruit the patients with some support and possibly expand the label of FDOPA beyond Parkinson's disease into the medullary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, the other comment I has, have is about the gallium generator. We heard that in Australia, uh, it's available uh, easily. We do also have uh, availability of gallium dotatech, although it is a little bit limited. You have to order uh, very much in advance and now the demand is high so you have to be even more vigilant one option would be just uh, less than a week ago or actually exactly a week ago there's a new uh, approval that came in for copper 64 dota tape and that can potentially be an option in case if you have to order in a pinch so just to let you know this is just a week ago that fda approved yet another agent 
And uh, with regards to the Lutathera, yes, we have actually individually looked at the patient. So we, we heard at the talk about uh, theranostic approach. We can potentially use in patients who have extensive disease and it's not, as Mike mentioned, actionable. You can at least get some potential short and medium term control of the disease using theranostic approach with Lutathera. And I'm aware that there are few other agents in the theranostic spectrum that are in the pipeline. So there'll be more options for treatments of these patients in the future. That's great. Um, thank you very much. We are pushing the nine o'clock hour. Um, and I do wanna put in um, one plug that uh, Dr. Rossley did comment on the use of selpercatinib, which is um, an, um, a topic that we will be covering coming up in October. Um, so if uh, you have an interest in um, applications in medullary thyroid cancer, uh, please stay tuned for that. And so I w again want to thank all of our attendees and all of our and both of our presenters, um, Mike and Munir. Uh, thank you and look forward to seeing you again next Friday. Um, everybody stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks, thank you. Jake.